Welcome to the Living Your Career Show, everybody. My name is Roisin Duffy. The Living Your Career Show is for you, the job seeker, the advancing professional. We want to give you the confidence and the tools to pursue your dreams, your career choices, to back yourself. Our guest today is Kate Cullen. Kate is an undergraduate and EMBA qualified um, professional. I would say, and she knows, she's an executive on the rise. Kate works for the most admired Fortune 500 commercial real estate giant CBRE. She is the current general manager of Queensland and director of Pacific Business Operations, Kate. I think I've got that right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So Kate is an active member of the executive team and she works with her executive managing director and they are responsible for driving growth, prosperity and well-being in those regions. Kate has an early career in HR and operations. Uh, she has worked for education, top tier education, engineering and legal firms. And she is laying solid foundations for her continued evolution. She's a former representative ice skater, a scholar, mother, executive, the list could go on. <laughs> She is acknowledged as a Pacific Circle of Excellence winner 2015-2018. Kate's drive and persistence to me is what stands her out. She comes from a place of, I guess, Kate, I would say extreme inner confidence, and you really know your personal why, what motivates you. And I see you as charting a path, like having that real sense of charting a path uh, towards career fulfillment, that all things are possible, just not at the same time. And when we spoke during the week, you said to me, I said, how do you manage to do all of this? And you said, Roisin, I think all things are possible in my career, exactly as we've described, just not at the same time. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be the theme of our show today. Kate Cullen, welcome to the Living Your Career Show. Thank you, Roisin, it's wonderful to be here. What an introduction. <laughs> it's you, it's you. <laughs> Um, Kate, we all think, and I, you know, I've obviously thought about, you know, what people think about when they're starting out, when they're growing up, what decisions they make when they go to university, what happens after university, you know, life is filled with, dis with choices and opportunities and pit stops and times for reflection. Did you have a grand dream? I guess when I was growing up, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to be. I didn't have a grand plan, but did you, did you have a grand plan? Did you kind of have a sense of what that reality might look like? in your career? I, I, I loosely did. And I found, um, as I've sort of talked to people throughout my career, it is a little bit unique. Uh, when I was from a really early age, um, you know, my siblings would be out there painting or building Lego and going into sort of streams of work that relate to uh, those sorts of preferences. Um, I was in my organising my bedroom into a shop front that I could sell all of my items to my siblings and make some coin for it. And then I would take it to a, a new level and bake for them and sell, sell my baked goods to them as well. So I'd always had this really commercial nature about me. And I knew that I wanted to, um, to run a business. Um, in my teens, I'd spent a lot of time um, traveling with my family and uh, in hotels. And I had thought, well, that's it. I want to be a hotel manager. So for a very long time, from probably the age of sort of 10 or 11, um, hotel management was my career goal. And uh, going through high school, um, there was a great course through the University of Queensland, which is quite new, which was basically hospitality management with all the business management um, sort of functionality and focusing on hospitality. Uh, because it was quite new, the OP requirement was not very difficult. And um, I thought, well, that's great. I'm going to get in. <laughs> And going through high school, I just chose the subjects to align with that, but then also knew that I didn't really have to try all that hard. I was quite academically minded. I've always been very good at school, um, but I was also, as you mentioned, a competitive ice skater at the time as well. Um, and I also really wanted to work, so I had some part-time work. So I was juggling a lot and um, I was able to kind of prioritise accordingly. And um, got to the end of school, ended up with an OP of six, which was, you know, fairly good. And um, right up there. that, yeah, it actually opened up more opportunities in terms of, um, you know, which degree to go into. So you could do a, a general business management degree, which had much harder um, OP requirements. And I thought, well, that's probably a good idea just to kind of cover that base. I'll still do hospitality management as a major 
and um, I'll just have that bit of paper that could leave my options open outside of that. So, um, yeah, so I, I went into the business management degree with UQ. I had some great experience um, working in hotels in that time. I had some, a great um, structured work experience placement, um, connected with a great mentor, got to the end of my degree and um, there was a plan for the hotel that I was working in to establish a traineeship uh, for, for management, uh, but they weren't quite there yet. So I discussed with my mentor, um, you know, I'll apply for a couple of graduate roles and I ended up getting offered a role with the University of Queensland, which is obviously a great educational institution. And um, so I said, Tim, what do you think I should do? And he said, well, look, hat off here. Education is a wonderful sector to be in. Um, so we're, I don't know where we're at in terms of our traineeship program, but I think just go for it, get the experience. Um, it was a HR role, which was my other major that I decided in university to take. And um, it was fantastic. And so throughout that time of doing the, the HR role, um, it became really evident to me that maybe it wasn't, hotels might have been a bit limiting in terms of um, industry. Um, I also learned that it's uh, it can be a little bit thankless when you're working through the ranks of hotels, you're working, not that I'm afraid of hard work, but the, the nature of the work, um, the way that it's remunerated, it's, it's really, really tough. And so, um, I thought, well, I'll, I'll keep my options open in terms of industry and see where, where we land. Um, so, yeah, so when I was working for, for UQ, uh, like I said, great, great institution, but um, some good advice that I got from my manager there was, uh, you know, she loved me, thought I was doing a great job, but she sat me down one day and she said, Kate, I think you're actually wasted here. I'm like, what do you mean by that? She said, well, you know, you, you want to do things differently. You can see how we can make things happen. And unfortunately, we're in an environment where this is the way that we'll do things because they work. And um, I honestly think you'll get, you know, greater satisfaction out of being in the private sector. So that was probably the best bit of advice. She could see it before I could, but she was so right um, that being in a, in a private sector was um, much more aligned to, to, to my skills and capabilities and, and just my preferences. So uh, from that point, the, the career goal really became around, okay, management, C-suite, executive in a professional services environment. Let's kind of get in and see what I can learn and build in order to get there. And that leads on to the, you know, it's interesting that you had somebody who had your back very early on and could mm -hmm. see your potential, but you also had somebody who was almost like giving you that career advice independently, which is interesting. We'll come back to that in a moment. How mm. important now when you're looking at your commercial career, how important was it to you to find that right organization? How important, because you've worked for top tier lawyers, top tier engineering, and now Fortune 500. And again, you know, one of the most favored companies over the last nine years by Fortune 500, which is CBRE. How important was it for you to search out those companies, to find the right companies for you? That was actually the sort of, in the early stages of my career, that was number one. I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, I knew that I wanted to get exposure to different environments to learn what where I was going to thrive. So that involved uh, really large organisations. Um, it involved different industries. Like you mentioned, it, there was education, there was engineering, there was law. There was different company structures. Um, so from large corporate to partnerships. Um, so that exposure to the different um I guess, industry structures and also leaders at the time was actually, it, it seems a bit choppy if you look at the first kind of part of my CV, uh, but it was by design because I just knew I needed to experience it um, in order to work out what I really valued and where I really wanted to be. It's, it's kind of interesting because I think a lot of young people when they're starting out, you'll often see kind of almost like a flotilla of roles. And I sort of think I prefer, and it's like a degree if people are starting and studying something that they don't love, change it. Mm. You know, I, I sort of feel like, you know, listen to your gut, listen to the people who have your back, listen to those people that can seek career advice. Mm. Uh, talk to people that, you, that are influential, that you can respect. Uh, with degrees, change them if they're not right. And with jobs, if they're not right, move on, keep moving. You need to find your happy place, yeah. a company that's going to value you. When you, Kate, look inside, and I think you've always been confident. But when you, and I guess, you know, being an ice skater, as you said to me as well, and traveling around the world, you know, you have great sort of excitement in your life. You've great ups, you've great downs too. 
But when you look deep inside, where do you believe your inner confidence and your personal why comes from? What is it about you that charges you to succeed? I think, um, you know, a lot of it would be to do with um, messaging that I got as a very young person from my family, that sort of personal upbringing. Um, the, the conversation that you and I had earlier this week around, I guess, my belief that everything is possible, um, not at the same time, that's a quote direct from my mother. And I got that at a very young age and she reinforced that to me throughout my childhood. If you if you want something, you can absolutely have it. Um, just know that you're not going to be able to have it all at the same time, so prioritise. Um, for me, that really helped me to, to create this mindset, which I've had my whole life, that anything is possible. Um, and I think if I overlay that with some good learnings that I've had about understanding what's in, in control, what's inside of your control and what's outside of your control. So if I want something and I feel that, you know, all the matters that would sort of line up to allow me to get there are inside my control or, or my influence, then go for it. There's no reason why you can't do that if that's what you really want. Um, and it also helps identify, it sort of ties in you, um, we are talking earlier and about some literature and uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People really has become a bit of a Bible to me because that's one of his seven habits about identifying those things that are inside of your circle of influence and, in, and control and things that are outside of it. And it just really allows me to um, say, well, you know, why not? I think, you know, a, a, a non-work example of this, um, which I was trying to <laughs> think about, is um, have you ever read a Gourmet Traveller magazine? No. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful magazine with beautiful pictures. It's got all the great restaurants and all the great food that you've eaten at all the restaurants. And it actually gives you the recipes of some of these great um, meals that you would sit down and have in fine dining. And most people will look through Gourmet Travel and they'll say, oh, that's lovely, I'll go to that restaurant. I look through Gourmet Travel and go, I'm going to cook that meal. So there's, they've given you the recipe, they've given you what ingredients to buy. There's absolutely no reason why you can't cook that meal. And I've made a habit out of trying to recreate these, these beautiful gourmet meals because I think you can do it. Whereas I, I know a lot of people will sort of sit there intimidated and go, oh, that's a, a world-class chef who has created that. There's absolutely no way that I can do it. Well, I'm like, well, it's all there ready to go. Just get on and do it. <laughs> You know there's going to be a host of people ringing you and sending you messages and saying, what are we doing for Saturday night? Because I can see that happening, you know. It already um, happens. <laughs> for sure. If I was in the neighbourhood, I'd be coming in. Um, inspiration to push through on the tough days. Because, you know, you're spot on. Don't sweat the small stuff. Focus on the stuff you can influence, the stuff over which you have control. But even that... Even when you have that mantra or you have that, that modus operandi, there are tough days. What sources of inspiration do you look to or find? How do you cope with the bad days to push through so the next day is a better one? Um, good question. Uh, for me, mindset and, and mental health are really, really important. Um, so, look, if it's a tough day because things are really busy and there's a lot going on and I just can't get everything done, I... Uh, you know, you, you can feel really overwhelmed and you, you can start to cloud in your mind. And I know that if I'm in that um, state, that I'm not going to do anything well. So it's really important for me. Uh, you know, I, I learned, um, you know, in, in, only recently in the past five years, the, um, the value that you can get out of mindfulness and even just a quick sort of 10-minute session where you take yourself away, you, you do, you know, proper breathing and the way that you think and it can completely clear your head. So that you can go on and do effective decision making for the rest of the day. And at the end of the, <laughs> the end of the day, you can only do what you can do. Um, if it's a tough day because something's gone wrong, um, I am really one of those people that if things can go wrong, just don't lose the lesson. So I reflect on those days and, and I learn far more on the tough days when something's gone wrong and I go, well, <laughs> I am not going to do that going forward. This is what I do to rectify that so that I can take that learning into future situations because they will come up. So I, I get a bit of a buzz out of that weirdly, out of those challenges if things go wrong. Yes, you you know, you get annoyed initially, but you can't stay in that state. You have or I have to move to a state where it's very solution orientated just to make sure that never happens again. And that's been, you know, a real pinnacle of my own growth um, through those tough days. I was reading about our needs and wants in our careers. I need to have because that's essential. And I want because that's a desire. And then 
I read, I think it was in the Harvard Business Review about your shoulds. I should do this. I should do that. I'm curious to know because you're a high achiever, a classic high achiever, and classic high achievers always know what their needs are, always stretch towards their desires and aspirations. But in all of that, there's a lot of I should do this and I should do that because that's part of propelling yourself beyond what you do every day. How do you, I guess, keep that I should at bay? And you've just said how you focus on what you really do every day, but there's a lot of periphery around all of that. Mm. How do you shut out the I should? You know, I'm a mother, for instance, beating yourself up because you're not there at, you know, something first thing in the morning or, you know, you miss breakfast with them or you're not home for tea. I mean, we're, and it's not just about mothers, it's fathers, it's everybody. How do you rule away or shut out the I shoulds and, f- and what for you in terms of needs and wants do you prioritize? I, I have never heard that term that way before, but I couldn't agree more. And um, I think for me, I've always juggled. I've always had career or education or family or, you know, elite sporting, lots of things. Um, and I go through this process of, you know, prioritising where I need to amp up my time and energy on those things according to what I know is right for me. Um, So that's what takes my time and my energy and my focus. And then you do get this periphery of should. um, And I've I've spent a lot of time actively blocking that out, to be honest. And, you know, it's definitely hard when you're young um, to not be influenced by what other people think you should be doing. But I think what I learned is that if we go back to that sort of circle of influence and circle of control, a lot of that commentary it's completely outside of your control. And in fact, if I, it, it's probably quite contrary to what I've designed as my priority set. So if I were to shift my time and energy towards a should, um, then something that I actually need or want is going to be sacrificed. So, you know, and, and you mentioned having children, it's being pregnant or <laughs> how you have, have your child or how you raise them, particularly as young children, is a huge one that, you know, a lot of society a lot of people want to weigh in on and um, my husband and I sort of sit and we got to the point where it became a little bit humorous because what we identified is that people would strike up a conversation with you and we felt that it was really to justify the way that they did things so the way that they did it was the way that it should be done and therefore it's the way that you should do it without really understanding your own context so um, we, we learn to take that advice on and go, that's wonderful. And sometimes there is a little bit of gold in, in that. If you do find that a should is coming from a place where there is an understanding, if someone has sort of sat down and, you know, my mother often gives me shoulds. Some of them I take on, some of them I don't. They're always in a really good, um, there's a really good intent there and she does really understand me. So I'll take that on board. There's other people who don't wouldn't have a clue about what I've got going on in my life. Um, I'm, I'm just not going to be able to I don't have time to pay attention to those things so it is important for me to be able to block them out I know I think back to mine when I was raising my son we're all people were experts it was one of the things I swore I would never do because my life was crazy anyway and still is crazy and I don't know I sort of think maybe I passed on something to him because he's going fine (laughs) and career choices and benefits you know we we look at sort of you know the choices that we make the benefits that they will afford us versus the cost and the investment of all of that. How do you weigh up? Um, How did you weigh up, for example, doing the MBA? How did you weigh up, you know, the sacrifices and the opportunities, the investments of taking, you know, being an executive? Um, You know, you did your MBA and your executive and had a baby all in the last three or four years and you already have a four-year-old. Now, for me, I'm thinking, dear Lord, does this woman sleep? (laughs) And how does she wake up in the morning fresh and energized and focused and all those things you're talking about? So perhaps you can tell us, you know, say next month you're offered a big career promotion. How would you weigh that up now? And and so that other people could understand your mindset when you think about these things. I've um, I've always been very planned and quite sequential in what I've done in my life. So... As I've said, you know, everything's possible. Um, You're going to have to prioritise and recalibrate at different times. So where am I right now in that plan? 
Um, I'm not too rigid. I got some good advice actually not too long ago about looking at it from a sort of a decade by decade perspective. So in your between 20 and 30, I want to achieve this. Between 30 and 40, I want to achieve this. And 40 and 50, I'd like to achieve this. If the opportunity aligns with the overall plan, then fantastic. And if I do have the ability to recalibrate perhaps some of the energy that are going into other things in my life, then great. If I don't, then I, I yeah, I would probably pass it up. And I, I do have, I've actually got an interesting example of this quite early on in my career where, um, you know, as I mentioned early on in my career, I wanted to experience different industries and I wanted to learn where I was going to fit. And one of the things for me was being in an industry which I could be passionate about, really understand, be passionate about what we did, because if I'm going to manage that company one day, I, I want to actually have some sort of connection to it. Um, I also really want to make sure that there's substance into what I'm doing. I want to make sure that I'm the most qualified person for that role um, so I can do it with confidence and I can do it well. Um, so I, I had an example when I was working for the engineering firm. I joined them pre-GSC and it was so busy. The things were booming and it were, I went from sort of assistant HR advisor right through to, um, you know, being the, the HR sort of advisor um, very, very quickly. And uh, then the GFC hit and our team of 15 in the HR team went down to me and my manager and one other person and we became the jack of all trades. We, we maintained a reduced size business. It was still a substantial business, but it was reduced through that period. And then it started to pick up again. And um, we're sitting around a, a boardroom table um, and that were, and because I'm you know, one of very few people left there from a HR perspective, I'm at the boardroom table. I'm a 22-year-old. I've got all these responsibilities and we're learning about, you know, a new gas pipeline that's going to go through PNG. And so, my goodness, I don't really know what this means <laughs> and I'm just not really, like, feeling it. Like, I just uh, I couldn't get excited about this thing that was actually going to turn the business around. It was going to be a huge commercial benefit to us. So, okay, so this is a bit of a problem. And... Um, so then I decided I probably needed to find another industry and I started having conversations with the management team about, look, I, this, this is where I'm at. Um, and they said, look, what is it you want to do? And I said, well, I really want to go into general management. I didn't talk so much about not loving the industry, but it was more around I want to be in, a, in an industry where I can see myself as a general manager. And they said, well, you can do that here. I said, okay, um, how would that happen? They said, well, we'll spend the next six months Basically, you can shadow our um, MD and then we'll put you on a basically an expert program to be our operations manager for the Queensland. Well, why on earth would you do that? I am not the most qualified person for that role. <laughs> also, it's in an industry which I'm not loving. What a great development opportunity, obviously a promotion, but I just couldn't do it for those, for those reasons, those kind of values that I had. I, I couldn't take that promotion. So um, it wasn't so much to do with workload at that stage. I didn't have a problem with any of that, but it was more of that values alignment. So when I look at opportunities that, that come in um, for me now, it, there's, there's two things that I'm looking at. Does it align with my career goals and my values that I hold in that sense? If it does, fantastic. And I'm probably going to push really hard to get it. But the other factor is how does that fit in with the other things in my life and my plan there? Is it going to allow me still to have adequate time on, on those things and obviously young family is um, becoming more consuming as well. So yeah, there's there's a, there's a few things that will weigh into that. Um, but I do think that, you know, I, I'm at a level now where I don't necessarily think that a promotion is going to require, um, you know, 50% more time commitment or something like that, unless it was in a part of the business which I needed to upskill in or something like that. I, I think those promotional opportunities now are very much around capability, your ability to make great decisions, those sorts of things. So, and and I just have to be upfront and honest, and people know about what you know what my capability is, and um, I'll continue to fit, fit everything else in around it. Kate, you think about your twenty-two-year-old around the board table, and you're thinking, you know, your heart would be absolutely overwhelmed with, you know, excitement and fear, and I can just imagine the amount of, you know, the emotions running through you. Did you? So at CBRE, it's a big company, Fortune five hundred. You know, one of the favorite, I think, companies. I think for the last nine years, by Fortune five hundred, voted as such. Uh, um, my question to you is this. Um, did you feel the peer pressure to do your MBA so that you could reach that next level? 
uh, was would that have happened anyway? Or did you feel that if I really want to sit around this table and I really want to lead this charter and I really want all the confidence that I can have to be the best that I can be as a professional, I need to have that MBA? Um, interesting. I think my decision to do it's probably a little bit different to others. Um, so when I left that engineering firm, I went into a law firm and um, wasn't where I wanted to be, but took a lot of great learnings from that experience. And one of them was um, the marketing manager at the time. I, I thought she was wonderful. She was very commercially minded. She, on a similar sort of trajectory, she wanted to be a general manager. And she was doing the executive MBA through QUT. And uh, I just, she said, you would love this program. This is how it's designed. Um, at the time, there was a, a 10 year, which I think is still maybe still the case, a, a 10 year management experience to kind of qualify because you are in a cohort of other executives when you're there and they want to make sure that standard's there, which I totally got. So from that point, I just thought, great, all right, well, I'm what, four years in now, in six years' time, I'll organize and do my executive MBA. So I just always had that on the radar. I knew why I wanted to do it. I'd had such great um, feedback from someone who'd had. Um, similar undergraduate and then work experience to me and she uh, talked about things like the the network uh, the professional network the learnings that you can get from other people the professional development that it was able to she was then able to bring back into the organization and I thought well, that's what I I love I'm I've got that sort of brain and I think you know it's not everyone but you know some people do or I can grasp academia I can grasp a concept and then I can put into a practical environment and apply it and tweak it accordingly. So I knew that I could, once I was working with CBRE, to overlay this executive MBA. And my natural style is to bring all of those learnings into the organisation. Uh, my managing director here loved it because every sort of Monday after we'd had an Ember weekend, I'd sit down and we'd have a session. And I'd tell him what I'd learned and I'd tell him how we're going to apply that. And he just thought it was absolutely fantastic and became the best advocate for that sort of learning for anyone in a, in a general management role. So it was very much by design. It was in the plan um, and I was very well supported within the business to apply that, which I think just made it all yes. more relevant. Uh, we're talking about, um, you know, when you do these sort of things, there are trade-offs. You talked about sequencing and you, then staggering. Well, I guess the other question following on from the MBA is there's something else in the pipeline that you sequenced. You've done the MBA We've got the ba the babies, you know, you're very well supported at home and, and at work. Is there something else in the sequencing that you've kind of put for the next three to four or five years potentially? Uh, yes, and it's not to do with work, but it's um, my house. I've always <laughs> been obsessed with beautiful Hamptons homes. Um, it's one of my hobbies to sit on Pinterest when I have five minutes and just look at floorboards and architraves. Um, so about 12 years ago, we bought the house that we're in now. It's on a beautiful block in a place that we want to live, but it's a 100 square metre worker's cottage. And, you know, if we wanted to dedicate the time and the money five years ago, we probably could have, but I, we really needed to to, our sequencing was let's have the kids first this is actually a perfect home for small children because it's single level they can draw on the walls and we don't care um and then once the and also we're paying for double daycare so <laughs> once that's all done then we'll put in the dream home so uh yeah we're actually starting we're, we're close to having one out of daycare next year and then we're two and a half years away from uh from that milestone and we'll align <laughs> the uh construction of the new house with that as well <laughs> I've got a couple of questions and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask them. You know, people say, would that level of, I guess, confidence and motivation and determination, people would say there must be trade-offs. Have you felt that at times you've had to trade um, and has that bothered you? Or have you said, no, I don't want that opportunity and how did you, because I think there's that thing, if you don't take the job, you'll be passed the next time. You know, that sort of thing. So there's two things. There are missed opportunities potentially or trade-offs. There's always that thing too when you're a female, when you're, when you're a mother, when you have children, you've always got to look like you're on fire because otherwise they won't pick you for those jobs. They think you're, you won't be able to cope. You won't have the capacity. But in this instance, it's really about trade-offs. Have there been trade-offs or have you just simply structured and managed yourself so well and sequenced your activities and your growth so well that it hasn't mattered? Uh, there have been, I mean, there have been 
small trade-offs and I'd consider them small only because, you know, I've got, I guess through this structure, I've developed unknowingly quite a, um, a good problem solving framework for myself when it comes to opportunities, when it comes to, you know, things that just happen and how to adjust around that. And so, you know, whenever something comes up and it's an opportunity, I've got quite a good, let's call it a decision making matrix that I can work through and make a logical decision for me at that time. So to then sort of sit back and be mad at myself for making that decision, I just never, never done because I know at the time that has absolutely been the right decision for me. Um, but uh, can I give you a fun example of this? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so when, um, before I joined CBRE, I was working for a law firm and um, they went through a big partnership dispute and I found myself, like a lot of people right now, um, in, in a position that was made redundant. So it was the very first time in my career where I actually had this sort of, let's take a step back and work out what you're going to do. It was refreshing and, and actually really a really positive thing for me. So I was kind of considering all options at that stage. I could have started my executive MBA at that point. I didn't do it until a couple of years later. But I'm like, start studying now, look at different industries. Um, so I had had study potentially. I had two job offers, CBRE being one of them, um, Virgin being another one. And then my, my other option was my sister-in-law really wanted us to be in MKR. So this is quite a few years ago when MKR was, um, you know, only a couple of years in. I didn't really know what it was, but we both love cooking and uh, we thought it would be a really great idea. And I'm like, hey, I haven't got anything else going on right now. That could be an interesting way to spend three months. So we went through the, the addition process. Um, we basically got through to the point that they, you know, drug testing you and making sure that you're fit to be on the on the show. And I got the offer with CBRE and, you know, you really have to, I was still very much in HR at that point, you have to sort of say, okay, well, can I be taken seriously as a HR professional if I'm interviewing someone and they say, hey, aren't you that woman that broke down because your souffle um, <laughs> collapsed on national TV? So uh, unfortunately, and to my sister-in-law's devastation, we uh, didn't go on MKR. Um, <laughs> and she hasn't really forgiven me for that. I know she says she has, but she hasn't. Um, but that's just one of those things, right? Like I could have been a B-grade celebrity and, uh, you know, reaped all of the wonderful rewards that come with that, I'm sure. But, you know, for me, the best decision that I could have made at that time was to go with CBRE. And obviously that was a fantastic one for me from a career perspective. I think MKR is a bit scripted. And I think you're too lovely and too real and too natural, potentially, and I suspect your sister-in-law's too, to not be yourself on that kind of a show, even though your cooking could be amazing. I have one question. People are going to be ringing you about that, probably that matrix, or, or getting in touch with me saying, Roisin, this decision-making matrix that Kate uses, we'd love to have a look at that if it's in, in writing. But one of the things that one of my directors said to me, uh, when, we, when we were first looking at doing this podcast, they asked the question, said, Rusheen, I often feel like I'm under a tremendous amount of pressure to deliver. I have two small children, um, and they'd be the same age as yours. And she said, how do people get to the top without burning out? She said, because sometimes I feel utterly exhausted. And by the way, I would, and this director would be listening to this podcast because I will make sure she does. Um, <laughs> I often say to her, you know, you put your work very firmly in your priorities and sometimes you've got to say no. But I'm interested in your view for people that are aspiring to go all the way, what would be, if there was one piece of advice you could give them to avoid burnout and, you know, the decision has been made, you're in the job, the pressure is mounting. How do you stop yourself from, from the balance going too far in the, in the wrong direction and actually you feeling exhausted and not enjoying what you're doing? I think there's, I can give the, the piece of advice and it ties into something else, but it, it's around that prioritisation, um, you know, and I don't, to your sort of comment before, I don't have this matrix sort of set down in paper. It's probably something that I could do and should do, but um, it, it's very much around what is important to you at that particular time. You've got all these different aspects to your life. There will be, it, you cannot physically give all of them 100%. I, we know that's not possible as human beings. So work out where can you be giving 80%? Where could you be giving 50% and still keeping those stakeholders satisfied? There's a communication piece that comes in with that as well. Um, but you need to, to kind of recalibrate that, that wheel of all those things going on in your life so that you're only 
able to put the the, the time and energy as they they match those priorities. Um, a really really important one, which I think a lot of people forget about, is their own health. There is no way that I can do what I do if I'm not healthy, particularly mentally healthy. And I think the the best thing that you can do there's all sorts of things that you can do to be mentally healthy and physically healthy the best thing you can do is get sleep you know people who you know burn the <laughs> burn the wire or the candle and at both ends and they're you know getting two hours sleep and they're trying to do everything that is just not sustainable and you're not going to be your best self i if i have less than seven hours sleep i'm not good in a in a, in a high pressure decision making environment if i get a good night's sleep i'm able to so I think if I look back on my life, it didn't matter how many things I had on at any point in time, I needed to get sleep. I, I would be studying for an exam on tomorrow for the MBA. I had a busy night at work. The exam's on it at 9 o'clock. Okay, I, I'm cutting off at 12 o'clock. There is no, nothing more that I can take in after 12 o'clock. I'm cramming. And actually, if I get a good night's sleep, my brain is going to function so much better in that exam environment than it would have if I tried to cram in six more hours of work and get a couple of hours of sleep and try to perform. So that, that's probably my best advice that I can give. Really understand your priorities. Understand how much of yourself will satisfy each of those priorities and the stakeholders involved. Communicate well around it. And, and then don't forget about your own health and, and make sure sleep's involved. <laughs> Yeah, and there's a whole thing there that sometimes you do need to push back constructively and manage those parameters, ring fence you and reinvigorate you. And yeah. um, I have one final question. Oh. So we're looking forward. What does career fulfillment look like to you one day? Cast your um, mind, you know, yeah, cast yeah. your mind forward. Yeah, I think it probably hasn't shifted, to be honest. Um, you know, back to our very first question around those sort of foundational decision making around careers and what I was aspiring to it was CEO in a professional services environment it's very much still that I've, I'd like to be a CEO um, professional services is where I thrive um, either there or in my own business as well and that's something that sort of on the next 10 year plan to sort of scope out you know where the pros and cons lie of the the, the big organizational structure which I've found I'm I am very um, well aligned to in terms of how I operate or whether I take that out and, and build something for myself. Okay, Colin, I have to tell you, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Um, people are going to love this podcast because you've <laughs> been so natural, so real, um, so insightful in your life and your experiences so far. And I mean, you still have such a long way to go. Uh, from my perspective, thank you so much. I've really appreciated it. And I've loved having you on the show. <laughs> it's, well, it's been an absolute pleasure anytime. <laughs> Um, to everybody else who's um, listening in or to those that are going to be viewing this on Facebook or uh, other social media channels, um, I guess what today was really about is finding that inner confidence, you know, finding that personal why, what motivates you. If there's a grand plan, you know, have some, even if you don't have one, have some, some sort of method or madness to what you're doing. And don't be afraid to take opportunities, but remember to protect you and all of that because um, there's no point in being immensely successful and killing the golden goose. And so Kate's thing is, yes, you can have everything, but you can't have it all at once. So that ability to be able to design and make decisions and salvage you in the context of having a great career and still being satisfied, I think that's what the key message is from today. And so for myself and from Kate, um, we'll be back again next Tuesday. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, and yeah, we'll see you and on. All the best for now. Bye-bye.